Roush sweeps the duels, Joey goes too hard, and is Ford really the favorite to win the 500? All that and more coming up next. <laughs> What's going on, everybody? If I haven't earned your subscription, hopefully today is the day I will earn that subscription. All right, let's get into it. The first duel was actually decided by a pit stop, and what a finish it was as the four Fords up front, who took two tires, battled it out amongst each other, but teammates did not go with each other. Austin Sendrick, for whatever reason, decided to flare out wide and not go with his teammate, Ryan Blaney. It ended up costing both of them as Brad Keselowski cruised to victory because Chase Briscoe, Austin Sendrick, and Ryan Blaney couldn't organize anything behind him after he made his move on lap four, which uh, the commentators were saying was way too early, but uh, apparently was not. Brad knew what he was doing, and he took that win. Uh, of note in that race, the Chevrolets were actually able to keep pace with the Fords. They were running the same lap times there at the very end. The only problem was that two-tire strategy took away from their opportunity to even get up there and mix it up with them. And uh, one thing of note, Tyler Reddick was actually with that four-car Ford group before he lost the draft with them. So I was actually really impressed with his performance and that RCR equipment there. And even almost as exciting as the finish of the race was the finish for the last transfer spot as Kaz Grala passed J.J. Yaley on the last lap. It was looking dire straits for Kaz Grala. Uh, this is just uh, one of those testaments to never give up, never give up, keep going. Uh, he was two laps down. J.J. Yaley was one lap down, and it looked like for the world Kaz Grala was completely out of it. But then on like the last lap or two, J.J. Uh, Yaley went a lap down and while he was going that lap down, Kaz Grala stuck with it and was able to get past him on the very last lap and make that final transfer spot for himself and the money team. So the money team and that bright, good-looking car is in the Daytona 500. Now on to the second race. The second race seemed a lot more hectic than the first one. The first one they sort of rode around. This one they were sort of jumping and jostling a lot more, uh, at least from my view. But uh, Ford, once again, gets the win. Chris Buescher, and it was another Roush car, so Roush gets the sweep here. Chris Buescher gets the sweep. And if you saw the back of Chris Buescher's 17 car, they had the little DeWalt sticker on the back. So is it possible we will get a Darlington throwback this year, maybe a DeWalt 17 in the Darlington throwback race? I think that would be really cool. But anyway, moving right along, Chris Buescher gets the win. Obviously, he made the move uh, on the last lap, or, yeah, the final lap, and Joey Logano went down there to block him. Joey Logano got down there to block him late, and that was the big story. Uh, but the other story uh, in that Greg Biffle did transfer. Uh, so let me just get that out of the way. Greg Biffle transferred. Uh, Timmy Hill, just for whatever reason, he was three laps down. Don't know exactly what happened with Timmy Hill other than he lost the draft. I don't know what was going on with that car, but uh, Timmy Hill didn't get in. But, of course, the big talk is, was Joey Logano driving uh, too aggressively or whatever, and uh, Joey Logano himself said, I just made a, a mistake, I made a terrible mistake, and it was just a dumb move. So I think even Joey Logano thinks he was was racing way too aggressively uh, for a duel. And not only that, though, he, he ruined his car, okay? But he also took out basically a teammate in the Wood Brothers car. Harrison Burton's car was probably the fastest in the field, in my opinion, because not only did that thing qualify good, it raced good, and it had a rookie behind it. Like, if it had a veteran behind it, he might have been, you know, winning that duel easily. But it, it at some point, I don't know if Roger Penske needs to sit Joey Logano down for situations just like this. I don't mind Joey Logano being this aggressive in an actual race, but for stages and for... Uh, duels and, and, and stuff like this, I mean, dial it back, especially this season when you don't have parts for the cars, like there's a supply shortage. This is not the season, and, and what makes it worse is he almost bragged about it going in, into this thing. He's like, I'm going to race aggressive. You, if you're scared to wreck the car, you'll never win, things like that. At some point, you got to be, you got to look at the reality of the situation. This isn't a normal year. There is a supply chain shortage and we don't have cars like we normally would have because we have switched over to this new car. Most teams don't have a backup for each car, at least most big teams don't have a backup for each car in their stable. 
So you have to sort of dial back your aggression in moments where it doesn't really matter. Like this didn't really matter. This is just uh, determining where you're going to start in the biggest race of the year. So uh, Joey Logano has to learn how to dial it back at least the first half of the season. But that being said, let's take a look at what we learned from these two duels. We learned that Penske and Ford are very strong right now. Uh, we saw it in the uh, clash at the Coliseum, and now we are seeing it at Daytona. The Penske guys, to no one's, at least not to my surprise, because this is basically a supercar, they have an advantage, and all of Ford looks like they have their hands around this thing pretty good, because even Roush Fenway, after that disappointing performance at the Coliseum, they might have just been laying back saving their stuff, who knows. But they look really good. Roush is always good at the restrictor plates. Uh, but the other takeaway from this is Toyota looked terrible. Toyota had a strategy. They implemented their strategy. They did everything they wanted to except for Denny Hamlin spinning, which uh, a, a lot of Alex Bowman fans uh, immediately got on Twitter and called him a hack for spinning going in there to pit. But other than that, Toyota executed their strategy flawlessly. They just did not have the speed to match or even catch Ford at the very end, whereas the Chevrolets were at least matching lap times. With the Fords, they were just gapped because of, of the poor strategy where Ford took two tires and Chevrolet took four tires. Uh, Toyota just could not match speed for speed what the Fords were doing in this race, and it absolutely cost them. And Toyota looks like they're behind the eight ball, and that should really not be a surprise because Toyota TRD has never messed with a car like this, so it might take them half the season or more to get their heads around it and start showing that speed that we are familiar with from JGR. My other takeaway from this is the RCR cars and the RCR affiliated cars were very fast. Uh, you saw in that first one that uh, Tyler Reddick was the only Chevrolet that could hang with the Fords. He took the two tire stop. They actually looked at the analytics. So I feel like RCR strategy and Ford strategy was on point, but also they had the speed. Uh, he was able to, Tyler Reddick was able to hang with the back of that Ford pack. And also in the second duel, before they got stretched out, there just weren't enough Chevrolets, uh, strong Chevrolets at least, to work together to make any difference in the second duel. But before everything got spread out, you saw Ty Dillon push Austin Dillon to the lead. So those cars have some speed, and even Greg Biffle in that race had some speed, and he was running well. They just didn't have enough teammates to, you know, make anything happen. So the RCR cars were actually sneaky fast, so I was uh, not surprised by that, but it was good to see that. It's always good to see two legacy uh, teams, right? Roush gets the two wins, and RCR is actually showing some strength. Like, we're used to the Hendricks and the Penske's, the guys with tons of money winning these races, but it's good to see some of these legacy teams. It's always good when, when Roush, the Wood Brothers, or RCR uh, run well, or any, any team like that that's been in the sport for a long time. So... I feel good about it, and I'm excited about this Daytona 500. I think both duels were good, and that is all I got for you today. If you like the content, feel free to subscribe down below. If you got a comment, leave it down in the comment section. I try to read as many as I can. And other than that, thanks for your time. Peace.